All right, guys, well, welcome back to the League Express podcast. We're on episode 11 now. Uh, my name's Jake Keenan, and joining me as always is the editor of League Express, Martin Sadler. And Martin, what a weekend of football we've had. All over the world. Well, both sides of the world, we should say, but both in here in in Australia, I thought lo- there was so much to watch. Mm. Over that, we nearly didn't put this paper out because I was too busy watching some great <laughs> rugby league. But oh, we, yeah. you know, we had to uh, we had to do it in the end, didn't we? But you know, fabulous! What an incredible NRL grand final. But but two great games as well in the uh, Super League playoffs. Um, and some interesting stuff in the um, championship playoffs as well, I thought. My goodness. So, uh, yeah, as always, plenty to talk about, uh, Jake. No, absolutely right. And, you know, if we keep putting up performances like that every weekend, you know, I won't be surprised if we do start seeing rugby league played all over the world in, in years to come, fingers well, crossed. Well, I'll, I'll tell you one thing about... <laughs> one thing... I mean, I watched the uh, NRLW Grand Final as well as the NRL Grand Final, and I really enjoyed the the, the women's Grand Final um, in in Sydney. And the thought just struck me that we, we're talking now about taking rugby league to Las Vegas next year. You've said you might go out and see it there. I wouldn't mind following you myself. <laughs> might be able to get but, some media passes, maybe. Well, you never know. <laughs> but but the thing is, again, watching that women's game. It, and, and bearing in mind that this has been an incredible year for women's sport, hasn't it? You know, the FIFA World Cup in Australia was a fantastic success, much bigger than most people imagined, and, 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 and generating massive TV audiences in Australia and beyond. So there's been a massive emphasis on women's sport this year, and I think the NRL will miss a trick if they don't take a couple of women's teams out to Las Vegas with them, because... In in the United States, there's a great interest in women's sport uh, of various sorts, and I think for 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 Americans, I mean, you know, you think about Americans watching rugby league and marvelling at how these players play without enormous pads and so on, which is always a reaction over there. But just imagine if they saw women doing that as well, mm. you know, and and I I think it would be tremendous, and I'd I'd, I'd really urge the uh, NRL to think very carefully about whether they could actually add a women's game to what they've already got planned over there, because I think it would add a lot to it. And I think it would draw more spectators, which Mm. is the important point. They're going to be playing in that 60,000 capacity stadium in in Las Vegas. And I think they need everything that they can get to fill it. Mm. And I think a women's game would you know, would be a big help in that regard. I think there's definitely a market for it over there too as well, because Mm. um, I think it was just over a month ago, there was a... uh, a live uh, college volleyball game that attracted nearly 100,000 spectators mm. to this stadium. And I think that broke all kinds of records for uh, women's sport over there. But, yeah, you're exactly right. There's certainly a market for women's it. Women's sport is thriving, and it's just fantastic to see um, rugby league, you know, being part of that process, isn't mm. it? And uh, I, I think the the biggest success story in rugby league this year is actually the NRLW competition. You know, it it rose from six to ten clubs. Everybody, or not everybody, but a lot of people said, well, that might be expanding a bit too rapidly. It might affect the quality of the competition. But I don't think it has. It's It's been a great competition all year. Well, not all year. It was, I think it was nine, nine rounds and then the semifinals and then the grand final. But I think it's been a really great competition mm. and... It will continue to expand in future years. Um, other, you know, the NRL clubs that don't already have teams in the NRLW are, you know, thinking very hard about doing it, including the New Zealand Warriors, who are the team who could really do with a team uh, in that competition to boost the New Zealand international side. Mm. So I think there's a lot of tremendous progress being made and. Uh, I hope it goes from strength to strength. Mm, absolutely right. And uh, thankfully, you were able to get the newspaper out this week. And, absolutely. Uh, you can grab a subscription to the League Express weekly newspaper on the TotalRL.com website. So that's www.TotalRL.com forward slash shop. Uh, you can get an online version, the digital version on um, through the website on Pocket Mags if you can't um, you know, get to the store and get one in person. We also have the Rugby League uh, World Rugby League Magazine. World. Yes, um, great magazine. Um, yeah. uh, the October issue has just come out, so just um, that you can only get that by subscription. Actually, it's not in it's not in the shops. It's uh, it's available by subscription only. So it's a case of going onto the website again 
and and picking it out and and taking taking a look. But I think anybody will really enjoy reading it. If 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 you love rugby league, you'll love the magazine. I think. Yeah, perfect. And we've also got uh, Richard's book, Fifty Wigan Legends in Their Own Words. Um, Fifty Wigan Legends. Yeah, I believe he's uh, again, doing a, a signing this week. Is he's that doing a signing um, on Thursday night at Waterstones Bookshop yeah. in Wigan. I think it runs from. 5.30 till 6.30, and he'll have lots of books there. He'll be very glad to talk about the book itself. I think he's giving a talk, actually, before doing the book signing. Um, and he'll talk about all the guys who he's interviewed in that book. And I think that will be a terrific thing. If you if you live anywhere, well, in Wigan or anywhere near it, uh, get on down to Waterstones and, um, and, and see what Rich has got to say. And I think you'll have a hugely enjoyable little event there. Mm. And uh, a must-have for rugby league historians for sure. Uh, now, while you're at it, if you are watching the YouTube video, there will be a link in the description to get to the uh, online shop to uh, purchase subscri- su- uh, subscription. Oh, I should spit that out uh, for all three of these. Um, so head on into the description. There'll be a link there. And while you're at it, you may as well uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel because we do uh, record these uh, podcasts weekly. You won't miss a thing. Um, but without further ado, we may as well get into the... Uh, why don't we kick off with the NRL Grand Final? Um, well, I was wondering, I was wondering, <laughs> yeah, I was wondering whether you'd want to talk about it as a Broncos supporter. I mean, twenty-four yeah. eight with seventeen minutes to go. The Bronco uh, Ezra, Ezra Mam had scored a fantastic hat trick of tries. What a great player! Um, Reese Walsh had made one of them and and looked absolutely terrific. I think the commentators said that. The Brisbane Broncos were sailing home, or mm. words to that to that effect, and I can only imagine that maybe Nathan Cleary heard what they said because yep. at that point he just took control of the game um, and created three twelve, scored the, the final try himself, but but played a huge part in two others and kicked that incredible forty twenty, didn't mm. he? Which which put them in in an attacking position, and I mean a lot of people are saying his performance was possibly the greatest single individual performance in a grand final that we've ever seen. And when you think about them coming back from 16 points down with 17 minutes to go, you've got to say that must be true, mustn't it? Can you think mm. of a better grand final performance from anybody? Uh, off the top of my head, um, not really. I just think that that 20-minute stint he had, that's the most impactful 20 minutes of rugby league I've ever seen in my life, let alone... Yeah on the grand final stage. It's certainly up there with one of the best performances I've ever seen. Um, What I would love to know is how many Penrith supporters, just before that comeback started, when they were 24-8 down, did many Penrith supporters leave the stadium thinking they'd lost the game? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to know that. Because, There's been uh, a few reports saying that they saw Penrith Panthers fans leaving. Yeah. Um, I saw an interesting post uh someone was asking, did you know any supporters that left the stadium? And unfortunately, one poor Penrith uh, Panthers supporter commented, I did leave, but it wasn't because of the scoreline. He said that his daughter was uh, having a bit of a meltdown because of how loud the crowd was. So unfortunately, right. he left right as the Broncos were starting to ramp things up. But yeah. he said some things in life, you know, sometimes you have to choose family over the Penrith Panthers. And uh, yeah. he said he listened to it on the radio on the way home and was still stoked that they got the win. But... You have to think it must be disappointing to miss out on that one. <laughs> well, it's funny, you know, I can remember a match many years ago when Wigan were playing at Bradford and um, with just over 10 minutes to go, there were 30 points to six down and there were a lot of Wigan fans there and they all started leaving at that point. Mm-hmm. And in the last 10 minutes, Wigan scored 25 points and won the game 31-30. Mm-hmm. So the moral of the story is never give up on your side. Mm. Um, always stay to the end because you never quite know whether they can come back and win a game that they look to be losing. And um, But it was sad for Brisbane because obviously they only had less than two minutes left when they had to kick off the final time mm. on Sunday and they were never going to, you know, get the uh, get the win back, were they? So, mm. Um, sad experience for them and, and, and their fans who must have been so jubilant at one point but um, that's just the drama of rugby league isn't it mm. it's just that's why it's such a great sport we we love it and we love it when incredible things happen on the field and, and certainly in the NRL grand final they did and mm. uh, just a wonderful game yeah it was 
I think at half time, I thought to myself, how are the Brisbane Broncos still in this game? In the first 20 minutes, they only completed four out of 10 sets. You, know, mm. you can't win rugby no. league with a completion rate of 40%. And no. um, that sort of remained throughout the first half. Uh, obviously, the Penrith Panthers, they completed every single set but one. So they had a 97% completion rate. Absolutely. And I just think to myself, yes, uh, the Broncos probably let that one slip through the fingers. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when you're coming up against a side that completes, I think it was like 37 sets out of 38, like how can you, how can you compete Well, the game was that, actually you know? transformed by Tom Flegler's yeah. try, wasn't it? Yeah. Just before the interval. I mean, it was 8-0 to Penrith. You were thinking, oh, they'll come out and and extend that lead in the second mm. half. You know, the, the Broncos are looking shot, really. Mm. And yet Flegler scored, and it was it it was debatable whether he scored, I thought. He, he just about got the ball down on the, the line. Uh, the try was given. And that must have really fired them up in the um, at, at half time, wasn't it? Mm. Because Kevin Walters would have been looking forward to, you know, trying to revive his side coming in 8-0 down and having been battered, really, in the first half. But then he's suddenly got a side coming in, having just scored, and feeling that the momentum could be about to change. And, of course, it did. Mm, and, right. um, you know, Ezra Mam put them ahead on 45 minutes with his first try, mm-hmm. um, and it looked as though the Broncos were never going to look back. Mm. And, uh, you know, amazing, absolutely amazing. I've got to commend Ivan Cleary's game plan going into it as well because there was a lot of opportunities there where it looked as though Penrith were starting to attack the Broncos' line. And what they kept doing was... They'd look to go wide and then they would keep bringing like the centre underneath Cleary. They'd turn him back on the inside or the second row and turn him back in towards the middle. And I think um, there was a stat thrown out there that that was the most tackles Payne Haas has made all year in yes. the game and yeah. the least amount of running metres he's made yes. all game. So yes. they just kept targeting the middle, trying to tire out Brisbane's middle. And you saw it in, the, in that last 17, 15 minute period, the fatigue started to kick in. Absolutely, and, particularly uh, for Cleary's final try. You know, at the beginning of the game, he would never have scored that try. Mm-hmm. But but players were were shattered at that point, and uh, that's what made it possible to do it. So yes, it it, it was a it was a an eighty minute plan, wasn't it, by mm-hmm. Cleary? And I think when Moses Leota scored that first try after Ezra Mams three, uh, I thought to myself, Ooh, the momentum started to shift a little bit. But it wasn't until Cleary hit that 40-20 where yeah. I felt the dagger go through my heart as a Broncos fan. I just yes. thought, oh no, here come the Panthers. <laughs> yes. And yeah. to kick that ball on third tackle and absolutely nail the 40-20 from, I think it was on his 30, Yeah, it was like he was a man possessed out there on the field. I'll tell you one thing that's worth remembering. Um, back in 2020, the Panthers were, it was the first of their four successive years in the grand final and they played Melbourne, Melbourne Storm. And similarly, they were behind by a similar sort of an amount, um, you know, halfway through the second half. And just as they did against Brisbane, they came back that day against Melbourne, but just didn't quite manage to win it in the end. Melbourne just about held on, but they were looking equally shattered. And you could see Craig Bellamy, if, if you look back at that game, you could see the anxiety on Craig Bellamy's face. He knew that, you know, another five minutes and Penrith would have won it. Yeah. Uh, but they ran out of time. And I think they've lear- they learned a lot from that game, actually. Mm. Um, and, you know, but, 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 but the central point is never give up. Never accept that you're beaten. Mm. And they didn't. And uh, That's right. it, was, it was really what the headline we've got in League Express is, a performance for the ages, and it certainly was. And what also highlights Cleary's um, performances, he also lost Jerome Luai and Isaiah Yo to yeah, Luai's amazing. shoulder, Yo's yeah. concussion, and for him to orchestrate that comeback uh, right as those two sort of left the field. Obviously, uh, Jack Cogger came on from that utility um, role off the bench. And Ex Huddersfield Giants player. That's who, right. Who never shone. At the Huddersfield Giants. Yeah, yeah amazing. But I thought once he came on, he did a great job of just um, really playing direct and it, it really freed up Nathan Cleary on the outside. Like it gave him that little bit of space and we mm. saw it. That's when he set up that try for Leota. Um, just, I think it was he's an unsung hero almost. Um, yeah, no in this doubt side. about it. Yeah. Stephen Crichton also was yeah. outstanding. Um, but yeah, there's so many different Steve, Stephen lines. Crichton's ability to, 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 to win... 
you know, to, to, to put a little grubber in and, and win a goal line dropout is, mm. is really great at doing that, isn't he? Mm. And something the Broncos failed to do on a few occasions, yes, the short absolutely. goal line dropouts, which, you know, proved costly yeah. at the end of the match. But, um, yeah, I'm still positive as a Broncos fan going forward. I'm hoping this will be the start of a similar reign uh, to what Panthers went through when they lost in well, 2020. you never know. Um, but there's plenty of, um, you know, competing clubs out there, isn't there? So mm. it's by no means guaranteed, but that's what makes the NRL such a great competition. Absolutely right. And, uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, we will see Herbie Farnworth, who had a great performance, uh, leave and Tom Flegler leave. So mm. fingers crossed they can replace Flegler those Flegler going to the Dolphins as well? Yeah, Dolphins as right, well. Right, that's going to be interesting, isn't it? And uh, he's actually today been named in the uh, Australian side, so he'll make his debut in the right. tournament uh, this year, which is... A huge rap for him, and what a pick up for the Dolphins. He's playing some tremendous yeah. football. Uh, but we won't spend too much time on the NRL. We'll get into um, some pretty crucial games we had over here over the weekend as well. Uh, Saints 16 defeated Warrington 8. Um, unfortunately, we see Warrington bear, um, bow out of the finals race, but yeah, the Saints ultimately too strong in the end. Yeah, and the, it was a game they had to win, actually, because, of course, it was the f- last game at the Totally Wicked Stadium for James Roby and for Lou McCarthy Scarsbrook, who've been such incredible players for St. Helens. And mm-hmm. um, if they'd lost that game, it would have been shattering for them, I think. Yeah. Um, they, they, it, it, it was a difficult game for them because there was so much emotion riding riding on it. Um, and they, they sort of bottled it up a bit until the very end. Mm. Um, and then... It, you know the the fans were able to pay tribute to Roby and and to LMS, you know, in in, in the best way possible. But um, you know, Warrington. I mean, I thought Warrington would lose this game fairly comfortably because um, Paul Vaughan, of course, had been suspended. In my view, quite unfairly um, from from playing, and and they, they didn't. I'm not sure whether Thomas McKayley was injured and, and and couldn't play. I've not seen the. Reports, but I was quite, if, if he wasn't injured, I'm surprised he didn't play. But mm. um, you know, without those two in the front row, I, I thought Warrington would really struggle. And I actually thought they put up a better show, mm. a much better show actually, than I would have uh, anticipated. They came out looking quite relaxed. I thought you know the, the tension seemed to have evaporated from them because you know they'd made the top six and um, they'd managed to edge out Salford for for, for that sixth place. And it was a game that they'd got nothing to lose in, really. And mm. and Stefan Ratchford led them out, as I say, looking very relaxed. And at one point in the second half, they drew back to eight all. Mm. Um, they, they scored a great try. I thought, uh, um, you know, young, um, gosh, what's his name now? <laughs> Connor Wrench, it was, mm. of course. Um, scored a, a terrific try. Um Sold a great dummy to Jack Wellsby and almost crawled over the line, actually, mm. by the end. But uh, absolutely marvellous time. Then they got a penalty to level the scores at eight all. And you, ba- you, you began to think the unthinkable. Could they actually shock Saints? But very soon after that, um, Peter Matautia dropped a ball and that turned the momentum back in Saints' favour. Soon afterwards, um, Tommy Makinson scored the decisive try and then they... Um, got a, a penalty to make it 16-8 um, towards the end and mm. the game was over for Warrington. But, um, you know, fascinating, fascinating game and uh, James Roby. The, the only thing that disappointed me about the game, Jake, in in a sense, um, is that in my view, James Roby is such an iconic player and, you know, it was his, coincidentally, his 550th game for St. Helens, which is just... To you as an Australian, must be unbelievable mm. that anybody would would play that many games because we play more games than you, of course. Yep. Um, my disappointment was that Saints didn't manage to get a full house for, for such a an iconic moment. You know, people in 50 years' time who were there as kids will be able to say that they saw the last home game that James Roby played at um, St. Helens' home ground. And, you know, you can't... It's just something to to remember, and it it tells you a lot about our sport and how poor we are at at, at making stars of our players. Mm. That the whole of the rugby league world didn't want to be there to mm. to, to witness that um, that final game at that at that wonderful venue. Yeah, I'm surprised they didn't make more of an effort to really um, do like a 
an almost like an on-field ceremony that was televised and yeah. uh, presented an award because I know like back home um like when a player reaches game 300 or even Cam Smith when he reached 400 games they did a, a huge celebration for it and uh, televised we it for the audience. We are doing that over here. We 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 don't do it and um just going back to the NRL grand final for a moment. One of my favorite parts of the NRL grand final day the presentation is when they you know present all the retiring players mm. you know before the game um they announce them all they've got banners with their names on and um they introduce each player individually to the crowd which i just think is a marvelous thing mm. and <coughs> we don't do that and we <coughs> for example in the past few years we if you look at the our grand final match program it does refer to the players who are retiring but we don't present them on the day and that's mm. just you know i think we should be we should always we should always celebrate those players who have achieved great things in the game and if we do it for example at the grand final we'd attract more people to to watch it because people who played for you know players who played for <clears throat> different clubs other than those that are there on the grand final day would would come to see wave goodbye to the players i think mm, so we're yeah. missing a trick but then we always do in rugby league in this country yeah that's right and um i read your piece <coughs> about it in uh, league express this week and um you know we even celebrated lachlan coot who um yeah, you know came absolutely. over here and finished his career over here so yeah um brad takarangi finished over here as well didn't that's he? right that's yeah. right so i think it's the least that uh you know the super league can do considering that you know, these players put a lot on the line to play you know 10 15 years in this league um you know putting their body at risk every single weekend and you know it's it's a little gesture of course um that can easily be done so yeah a bit disappointing but um few controversial storylines out of this one. Well, not so much controversial, but obviously we see uh, George Williams receiving a one-match ban, um, which will see him miss game one against Tonga, which will be quite disappointing. That will be incredibly disappointing. Yeah. yeah. You know, it. it um, I mean, I'm not even sure what he, what he was done for. If I'm, I mean, it, it was shoulder charge. Yeah, it? yeah, shoulder yeah, charge. You know, it, we, we, we just... We love sticking the knife in ourselves, don't we? Yeah. In this country. It's just like, ah, oh, you know, he, and especially because he, he's the captain, so he'll be going. Yeah. He's a vocal point of that uh, England side. And yeah. Yeah, it's a bit disappointing. If, but I'm, if, I'm, if, 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 if you don't mind me saying this, Jake, I don't think the Aussies would ever do that to themselves. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> well, you can't imagine, uh, yeah, back in the day, Cam Smith missing uh, international games. Um, or, or Nathan Cleary, if Nathan right. Cleary, you know, if I mean, I know he's possibly got a bit an injury problem at the moment, which might keep him out of Australia's games in the Pacific Championship. But they they don't do that to themselves, mm. do they? No, and it's like I think uh, even this year, I might have started last year actually. But in the state of origin arena, usually when there are offences committed, they'll opt to give them a fine instead mm. of a suspension, so it doesn't impact them at club level. Absolutely, and surely something like that could be taken into consideration. Well, uh, well the thing is, <coughs> the, yeah. the the thing is that. In my view, and, it, and, it, and, and we can include this business about the three Wigan players who served a suspension because they were in the reserve grand final mm -hmm. at the weekend. If you're suspended um, for an incident in a game, you should be suspended in that competition. Mm. I can't see the point in George Williams being suspended from an international game. Um, suspend him from the first game of next year's Super League if necessary mm. and similarly those three Wigan players who were never going to play in the reserve grade grand final mm. they should surely have served their suspensions in the next Wigan Super League game um, right. I mean it's just so obvious isn't it but I mean I can't blame Wigan for taking advantage of that provision you know yeah. if, if the provision's open to them they'll take it that's right. um, but it's just a ridiculous rule. It's mm. a bloody crazy rule. It really is. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, you can't help but think uh, whoever's, you know, it, it doesn't matter who you're playing. Uh, if you know that a team you're playing against has taken advantage of that rule, you'd be screaming to have it uh, you know, looked at. Well, yeah. of course. Yes. Mm. Obviously. Uh, yeah, big disadvantage. Um, now, Alex Wormsley also escapes uh, suspension. He had a bit of a shoulder contact to the head of... Uh, Judy Crouth. And got right, sin binned, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, some might argue that that's punishment enough that he got sin binned, um, mm. but yeah, luckily to escape uh, suspension on that one. Yeah, maybe. Although 
I, I didn't think it was uh, there was anything malicious in it at all. You know, I, I just didn't see didn't see a major problem there. I, I thought certainly a sin bin was the maximum um, punishment that that incident mm. deserved. If I'm honest about it. Yeah, no, it's good to see. Um, now we'll move on. Hull KR twenty defeated Lee six, um, and quite a turnout uh, in in attendance for um, Hull KR. It was nice to see the home fans really getting behind their side. Well, they are doing, aren't they, this year? And it, it's, it, it is great to see. And, um, you know, again, I think the um, Lee had sort of run their race, really, this season. I, th- I thought Lee did well to hold it to um, that scoreline. Mm. Um, I mean, obviously, missing Asiata, missing Ricky Lutelli, who, who they've been missing for quite a long time, mm. and missing Zach Hardacre. They've, no, they've got a fairly limited squad have, um, have, have, have Lee, and they... Just didn't quite have the, you know, the the, uh, the 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 weapons to counter Hull KR. But you know, Hull KR, it, what a great season! And uh, you know, there's been a lot of controversy, hasn't there, about Willie Peters not being not being shortlisted as you know coach of the year with four other coaches ahead of him. Mm. Um, and you know, my attitude is well, if he wins, if if he can get them to the grand final and then could even win it. There'd be absolutely no debate yeah. about who the coach of the year would be, yeah. and it sort of reflects the fact, doesn't it, that we sometimes shortlist people for awards before the season has been completed, yeah. and that's just you know um, it comes back to bite you, doesn't mm. it? If if you're not careful, that's what I was going to ask you. Should we wait until the grand final's been played before we well, start announcing? Well, I mean, wins? when you think about it, all these coaches um, are battling to win the grand final. Ultimately, mm. I mean, Willie has already won the um, Challenge Cup final at, at Wembley. <clears throat> Matty Peters won the League Leaders' Shield um, for Wigan. But also, y- you've got to bear in mind also, Paul Wellens won the World Club Challenge by mm. beating Penrith. And, mm. you know, doesn't that look even better now, the way that Penrith have played? So, mm. and, and he's not included either <clears throat> in the shortlist. So you've got St. Helens and Hull KR neither coach included on the shortlist. Wouldn't it be amazing if those two clubs won this weekend and contested the grand final? Yeah, yeah. It'd be <laughs> yeah. a real head scratcher, that's for yeah. sure. Um, but yeah, obviously next week we'll see Catlins take on uh, the Saints and uh, Wigan taking on Hull KR. So must wins for both teams if they want a chance to go to Old Trafford. Um, but yeah, it's... Oh, actually, one thing I wanted to ask you was, um, did you watch the games on Sky or Channel 4? Actually... Um I've, I've I've actually now seen both. Yeah, yeah. I've seen what did both. you make of Channel 4's broadcast? Oh, I thought Channel Four's broadcast is really um, is really great. In fact, um, we we actually included um, a comment from um, Adam Hills um, d- during that broadcast, and he made a nice comment about Warrington. Mm. He said, uh, "If the Warrington season was a working day." The morning was brilliant. The wheels fell off around lunchtime. Early afternoon, there was a bit of a struggle. And then the boss left for the day, <laughs> i.e. Daryl Powell. Yeah. And things started to pick up. I thought that was a really nice, you know, you can tell how he, why he's a comedian. <laughs> yeah, <you>? yeah, yeah. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant comment. Oh, that's awesome. And, um, you know, I thought, I, I, you know, I, th- I think, I mean, I, th- I, I, I th- I mean, I quite like Sky's coverage and I quite like Channel 4's. Hmm. And I, I just think it's great to have two different versions covering the game. You know, I've got no no massive complaints with either of them. And yeah. uh, I just hope that Channel 4 carry on next year covering the game. Mm-hmm. And sadly, next this coming weekend, Adam Hills won't be, um, won't be presenting it. Presumably he's heading back to Australia or doing something else. But, you know, I think he's been a real, over the last two years, a real breath of fresh air for, for, for rugby league. It's great that he's a rugby league fan. Mm. In fact, not just a fan, but a a player in PDR PDRL rugby league as well. And um you know, I think it's been a massive a massive thing for rugby league. And as I say, I just hope that Channel Four do um carry on next next year. No, absolutely right. And uh yeah I'm sure a lot of the fans are thinking the same thing as well. Um but sticking to the Lee Leopards, um What's going on with Brody Croft at the moment? There's been a few rumours um, surrounding him and P- 
potential transfers. He was linked to Lee Leopards uh, uh, via Jenna Brooks, I think, prior yes. to the Lee oh, yeah. kickoff. Um, yeah, have you heard anything else on this? And I think it's just bizarre that he's being mentioned as a transfer option. Why, why do you think it's bizarre? I just think for him personally, um, he's committed you know, himself to Salford on, on a long-term contract. I think for him to only have recently signed that and then already be... Well, amongst these whispers. you don't know what's in the contract. You know, yeah, yeah. you don't know what escape clauses are in the contract. So, we, we you know, it, it was a long-term contract. Mm. But nobody would sign a long-term contract without any sort of potential escape clause. The, the main one, in his case, would probably be going back to the NRL. Mm. Um, but Ben Reynolds is leaving um, Lee, at, or has left them now at the end of this season. And they will be looking for a replacement. So it, it seems fairly logical to me that they'd look hard at Brodie Croft and, and try and negotiate a, a transfer if they could get one. I would really be sorry, though, to see him leave Salford because I, I think Salford are a very important club mm. um, in the heart of Greater Manchester. M- my ambition is for Salford that one day somebody will come along, a Jim Ratcliffe or somebody like that who who's wanting to buy Manchester United, but will instead decide you know, that buying Salford would be pocket you know, lose change really, mm. and really make Salford into a big club. I think you know we need a a really big club in the heart of Manchester, and and Salford are it. Mm. And I think you know if if we could get Salford really challenging with some really great players, uh, expanding on the community work that they already do, which is a great a great thing for that club, um, and filling the stadium. I, yeah, the, the thing that makes me really frustrated is to see the joint tenants at that stadium sale sharks playing rugby union and getting bigger crowds than Salford Red Devils. Mm. I think, you know, if I had any influence anywhere, I would be dedicated to reversing that situation yeah. because, you know, it's it's Salford Stadium and I think we, we need to have them playing at the level that um, at some point they'll be demanding that the stadium be extended. Yeah, absolutely. And with Ben Reynolds, do you feel as though it's just a waiting game now to see what happens with the Rovers uh, to decide his future? Oh, yes. I mean, they, they won't sign him if they don't get promoted. And mm-hmm. um, and, and, and they, they, they may well, you know, I mean, obviously they're the favourites to be promoted, but <clears throat> they've actually got a a pretty um, interesting game this weekend, haven't they? Yeah. Featherston Rovers. They're... Yeah. they're I mean, it, if you know, if we if we look at, um, I think they're playing at six o'clock on six thirty p.m. on 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 Sunday, which is you know my least favourite time for a kickoff. <laughs> um, g- you know, given given our printing deadline on a Sunday night, yeah. but they're playing London Broncos, and that's going to be a, uh, quite a challenge for them. I mean, what a result for London Broncos to yeah. win forty two nil at Sheffield, and to. Um, you know, most people probably would have thought Sheffield would have won that game, but the Broncos talk about coming strong at the right time of the season. Mm. Um, don't be massively surprised if the Broncos really, you know, present a strong challenge to Featherston. Mm. And I mean, Featherston have been frustrated several times in recent years trying to get into Super League, and the Broncos, you know, are really going to come and, and and challenge them on on, on Sunday. Mm. And I think uh, when we talk about coaches of the year. Mike Eccles, the, Solf- the, the the London Broncos coach, must be a candidate in the championship, you would think, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we also had the Bradford Bulls, uh, 22 defeated. Uh, the Knights, was it? Eight? York so Knights, 22 yeah. to eight? Yeah. Um, so that sees them get through to the next round. Um, how do you like their chances next week? Well, they're going to... They're going to Toulouse, Toulouse and I yeah. can't see them beating Toulouse. Um, mm-hmm. on the, that's a Saturday game. Um it's going to be quite a challenge for them, but I, I think Toulouse are, you know, quietly confident of, um, of, of of getting promotion. I mean, everybody's expecting a Toulouse versus Featherston grand final with Featherston winning it and getting and going up. But um, Toulouse, you know, you can't underestimate them. I mm. don't think, and uh, and you certainly shouldn't do. Um, but I'll tell you, I, I also made the point in my column. I don't know if you noticed it um, this week, Jake, that. It's interesting looking at the championship because you've got Featherston Rovers at the top of it, which is a, a small, you know, town or village of about 15,000 people. Mm. You've then got five teams immediately below them. And looking at them in, term, looking at them 
in terms of the size of the cities, you've got London, which is 10 million or so, mm. Toulouse, which is about a million, you've got Sheffield, which is about half a million, you've got Bradford, which is just less than that, and then York, which is a major city as well, with about 100 and odd thousand people. Yeah. So you've got five cities and one very small town, uh, you know, and, and it, th there are more major cities in the championship than there are in Super League. Isn't that, yeah. isn't that an odd thing? That's amazing. And it's something that IMG may care to reflect on, I would think. Yeah, definitely. Mm. And I wonder if what IMG are hoping for, are they hoping that we can capitalise and get one of these other major cities into the Super well, League? Well, they've said for a long time that London is a major, is, is, it should be a major growth point for, for Rugby League. And sadly, London scholars have dropped out of the League One competition now, which is, which is a great shame mm. in my view. Um, but London Broncos are carrying the flag for Rugby League in London. Mm -hmm. And in 2019, they were desperately unlucky to um, be relegated when they had the final day of the season. They played at Wakefield and the loser was going to go down. And it turned out to be them and not Wakefield. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, they we, 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 we need a strong presence for Rugby League in London. It's a bit like what I was saying about Salford earlier. We need London. They're playing at the... Um, Wimbledon um, Football Club ground, the Cherry Red Record Stadium, which is a nice size um, for a successful rugby league club, I think. And, you know, we, we need London Broncos to get some great results. They need to be in Super League and they need to have some money spent on them and they need to be generating much, bi much bigger crowds and much better results. And um, that would do rugby league so much good. Mm. Yeah, tremendous opportunity, that's for sure. Now, moving on to a team who's just narrowly avoided relegation, uh, the Castleford Tigers. Um, news coming out over the past week or so that Danny Ward's not going to be... It looks uh, it, doesn't it? We'll it looks as though him. he's not going to, mm. yeah. Which leaves the door open for another candidate. If you had to put your money on one, who do you think it would be? Well, I'm just not sure who it, <coughs> who it will be because, I mean, the, the other guy who's been linked with them now is Danny Maguire, who's the assistant coach at Hull KR. Mm -hmm. But the problem, the problem for Castleford is that they, they're going to have to reduce their spending because of the reduced income from the broadcast deal next year. They've already indicated that they'll be playing on a reduced budget. Yeah. And obviously, if you're an incoming coach, that's not great news, is it? And I can only think that whoever the incoming coach is, would he, he, he or she, well, he, I suppose, he would... Um, recognise that it's going to be another season of struggle, really, at, um, at Castleford next year. And mm -hmm. how many how many guys would fancy that? Particularly, you look at what happened there in 2023. Um, Lee Radford left after about six games, didn't he? Then Andy Lass came in and left in, you know, later in the season. He's now got a new job as the assistant coach at um, the Catalans, by mm -hmm. the way. Um, so who would fancy it? Who would fancy that degree of um, uncertainty about about their coaching future? And Danny Maguire, the more obvious route for him is to be the eventual guy who takes over at Leeds Rhinos, mm. um, as and when Rowan Smith eventually departs. So you know, I wouldn't. If I were Danny Maguire's advisor, I'm not sure that I would give him all that much encouragement to. Mm. Um, to, 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 to go there, really. That's right. And I think uh, for the NRL, like you look at coaches like Cameron Serrata and Andrew Webster, who waited a very long time to eventually take on a head coaching role. Absolutely. I remember Serrata, he knocked down a, a number of teams uh, just because it wasn't the right fit for him. And you don't want to, um, you know, handy handicap yourself by going to a, a club that isn't prepared to invest everything into winning a, a you know, premiership or the trophy. So No. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I think um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if Danny turned it down and opted to stay in that assistant well, role. Well, I mean, the, the, the other option that Castleford have, of course, is to give the job to Craig Lingard because mm. he's gone there from Batley. Um, he, he, he went as the assistant coach back in... He was appointed at the back end of Andy Last's tenure at the club. Yeah. Uh, Danny Ward took over, but it now looks as though Danny won't be there. Um, but Craig Lingard is a very, very smart guy. And, um, uh, you know, if I were if I were Castleford, I'd, I'd be sitting down with him um, and discussing the job, basically. And, mm. and Craig Lingard, the other thing about Craig, when he was at Batley, he was, you know, coaching a team 
with peanuts, really, mm. financially. I mean, obviously, part-time players, it's a different matter, coaching full-time players. But Craig Lingard is, is a very smart guy. He um, understands the economics of the game, I think. And I think, you know, it would be very wise of Castleford to um, to think seriously about giving him the job. Mm, absolutely right. Yeah, it's... Uh It'll be interesting to see what way they go. They've announced a few signings over the past few days, um, a couple of PNG Kummels signing, yes. signings as well, which would be great to see how they go. And the Super League, obviously we've seen the great success of Edwin Apape this year. Absolutely. Um, and and of course the um, PNG um, played against the Aussie Pres- Prime Minister's 13 a week or so ago and, mm. and took them pretty close, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, absolutely. And just the, the scenes that were coming out of PNG, uh, as the Australian bus was sort of pulling away from the airport, mm. there was a lot of fans running along beside the bus. They just yeah. love their rugby league over they there. They do, yeah. Um, it's like Hollywood superstars walking in if you're Absolutely, a rugby league yeah. player. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so you touched on it before. Andy Last joins the Catalans as an assistant coach. Um, I think this is probably a great move for his uh, coaching career to you know operate under Steve McNamara. I think Andy Last is a better assistant coach than head coach. Mm. He's a very technically very astute guy um but i think he just sort of when he was at castleford um he was almost too much of a let's say a nerd really looking at you know the 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 detailed um elements of 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 the way they played the game and the statistics and all the rest of it but I, i don't think he was a great motivator of a team and i think you know being a being an assistant coach i mean he's been the assistant coach with England and, and so on, and he, he serves that role perfectly. Mm. But when you when some sometimes you promote somebody from being an assistant to being a head coach, and the requirements are so different, and uh, you know I think it, it's just not a guarantee of success. You mentioned Cameron Siraldo a bit earlier, and everybody thought he would be fantastic at the Bulldogs mm-hmm. this year, but he's he's you know they finished fifteenth out of seventeen. Yeah, I'd say his season's been a failure. Well, it certainly has, um, and uh, it's going to be a massive year for him next year. On the other hand, Andrew Webster went to the Warriors and and did a wonderful job, didn't he? From mm. you know the two guys who were both assistants at Penrith last year, um, you know, one was expected to be great, one was expected to be fairly modest in his achievements and it was the other way around mm, that's right you could never tell that's right and uh yeah i think uh ivan cleary has proven that their success isn't based on the work of their assistant coaches no, he's still got penrith no. to the grand no. final so full credit to ivan um in other coaching news uh in australia billy slater has re-signed with the queensland maroons for mm-hmm. a further three years we've also seen brad fitler um decide to walk i think he was offered a, a one-year extension um for less money to stay on as the new south wales blues head well he was coach. always going to turn that down wasn't he yeah that's yeah. right and i don't know they still get paid quite a healthy packet uh, i know it's technically a 12-month gig but when you're only coaching three games a year and you're on six figures yeah. um uh, the reported uh contract was 400 to four hundred fifty thousand dollars a year just to coach those three games obviously there's a lot of other events and things oh, they have yeah. to attend yeah. but yeah it's it's surprising because the new south wales board got brad fitler to come in and present his case um almost as you know prove why that they should give him another contract going forward um we also saw a number of assistants decide to leave their roles heading into next year so i think freddie pitched bringing in the likes of gus Gould to try and um restore that new south wales Blues culture. Mm. Um, now, obviously, they've came back with that twelve-month offer for less money, and yeah, Fitler's pretty much said no. You can find someone else. Which, yes, I don't know if that's the right move. Well, you isn't. never know. I mean, they are talking about potentially um, employing somebody who already coaches a club, but I think that would be a bad move personally, mm. um, because you know Billy Slater has shown. I mean, Billy Slater wasn't an experienced coach. But it's a very different role, coaching state of origin to coaching at, at a club level. And he's fitted the bill brilliantly. Yeah. Um, and, and New South Wales need their version of Billy Slater, don't they? That's Somebody right. Somebody who can come in, devote himself to, to the team without um, any club distraction. Mm. And I'm just not... I mean, there's been a lot of people saying Laurie Daly might come back and uh, be approached to, to do it. And that, that might be a really great move. I'm not... Uh, I'm not sure he did win one state of origin. I think it was in 
2014, if I remember, when he coached yeah. previously. They had, he had that um, you know, crucial win, which ended Queensland's yes. eight years in a row of dominance at yeah. Origin Arena. So yeah, I'd be happy to see Laurie come back. But um, I don't know. I think there's been a lot made of Queensland and, and Billy Slater and the fact that he's able to get uh, his players to believe that they mm. can win. And some might say that New South Wales sort of lacked that a little bit in this year's Origin Series. And, um, you know, the last few years, New South Wales have been heavy favourites going into every series and seem to come up short. And my theory is it's that Billy Slade has come in and he's surrounded himself with um, greats that have recently retired. And basically, you've got all this young Queensland side that are surrounded by players that they looked up to and players that they watched win eight years in a row. And whereas for the young Blues players in that squad, you know, they've grown up watching New South Wales lose every year. You know, I just wonder whether there's been a bit of a losing sort of mentality that's been I think there's a lot psychologically in that. adopted. Yeah, I think psychologically there's a lot in that. If you expect to lose, then you do lose, don't mm. you? And if you expect to win, you very often do win. That's right. But, but what, what, one of the things about Billy Slater, if, if you actually look at the press conferences, the post-game press conferences from this year's State of Origin... Billy Slater speaks incredibly well, um, as does Daily Cherry Evans. You know, when they were sitting there after that first game in uh, in Adelaide this year, when they'd come back and and won it at the end, a bit like Penrith did on on Sunday in the NRL Grand Final. Mm-hmm. You 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 look at that and you think, well, you know, that they have engendered this incredible spirit of never n- never surrendering. You know, right to the final hooter. And you could see that the the way they spoke about being a Queenslander in that um, in that press conference, it was actually, you know, I, I could have imagined being a Queenslander and being, mm. you know, quite inspired by what they said. Mm. And you never get the same thing from the New South Wales coaching team, whoever it, whoever it might be. Yeah. It, it it doesn't make your hair stand on end. Mm. And they need to get somebody who can make the Blues realise that you know, it, it counts for such a lot. Mm. And I don't know who that, I don't, just don't know who that's going to be. Yeah. For me, it's, you've got to somehow convince Joey Johns to go in and be the head coach, but mm. he's repeatedly said he's not interested and doesn't want that stress mm. and pressure on his shoulders, which you can understand. But yes. you watch him after a New South Wales loss in the commentary box and he's the most passionate, oh, you always say he's a sore loser at times. Well, there's no <laughs> doubt about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But he definitely displays that, uh, passion for the game and and I can um, attest to the connection that Queenslanders have with that side you know there's a lot of natural disasters throughout Queensland a lot of hardship that you know farmers and other working class uh, Queenslanders go through and you know come origin time that's the one thing they look forward to uh, all year round so absolutely um, yeah I'm stoked as a Queenslander Billy Slater staying on Um, and yeah Fingers crossed we can win again next year. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Um, But yeah, we also, we've had a lot of uh, fans across the world actually saying uh, that Adam G's refereeing performance in the grand final over the weekend was one of the best that they've seen Mm, in a very long mm. time. I just wanted to ask you um, what you made of his refereeing performance. Well, I didn't notice him. Yeah. And that's why he refereed well. Yeah. You know, he didn't didn't, um, insist that the game was about him. He gave very few penalties. I think the penalty count was, what was it, two to three? Mm-hmm. <coughs> um, and wasn't fooled by any player who tried to stay down and milk a penalty. That's right. He just waved the waved the game on and the players got up and carried on and soon realised they weren't going to... Because that element of milking penalties is creeping into the game. Mm. And, you know, as a referee... I mean, it's a fine judgment, actually, because sometimes if you do wave play on and then the player is injured, that you'd, it'd come back to haunt you, wouldn't it? But, yep. but he got all the calls right, and that was, um, that was terrific and, you know, good, good for him. No, absolutely. And I think there was a lot of calls there that could have been penalties on both sides, uh, but the fact that he let them play on, I think even as a Bronx fan who you know, obviously has lost, um, can't commend him highly enough uh, for his uh, performance, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, so, looking at other news, so yeah, we've had the Australian squad announced today. Some of the debutants include Selwyn Cobbo, Tom Flegler, Katoni Staggs has oh, been brilliant. named. Yeah. Um, so, unfortunately, he won't be a part of the Tongan side um, mm. coming over. 
and uh, Hamasotabuai Fido has also been named in the Australian squad. So, mm. so that weakens very good debutants. Yeah, that weakens the Tongan squad a bit, doesn't it? And mm. uh, which, from England's point of view, might be no no bad thing. Um, yeah, it's going to be an interesting concept, the Pacific Championship, isn't it? I mean, what's really interesting is. You know, the the kangaroos at one time were a, an iconic side. Um, I, I remember the 1982 kangaroos, the, you know, were just incredible, as were the 1986 kangaroos and even the 1990 mm-hmm. kangaroos. You know, we, we filled Old Trafford for the first test that year. Um, and yet, because they've played so little international games, other Australian national sides have overtaken them mm. in their sort of iconic status. Uh, so, so this year, for example, we had the the Matildas, the um, Australian women's football team, um, getting a fantastic degree of um, of, of, of of coverage um, both in Australia and beyond. So, you know, but but we've also seen the the, the Wallabies fail in the Rugby Union World Cup, um, and for many years they were. You're probably a, a more valuable brand than the Kangaroos. Mm. The Kangaroos need to win that position back again, mm. and hopefully, the um, the Pacific Championship this year will go some way to helping them to do that. Absolutely, and uh, competing in that tournament is Samoa. They've also announced their squad today. Uh, a few new debutants as well. Uh, Murray Talungi, who wasn't selected for Australia, he's going to represent Samoa. Mm. Um, We've also had, where are we here? Can't read my own writing. Um, Halem Lukey, the young back rower from the North Queensland Cowboys. He's going to get his debut, who's a promising up-and-coming player. Luciano, Luciano Leilua from the Cowboys will get his. Um, and Keenan Palacia is also going to debut. Yeah. There's also two youngsters, um, Sua Falongo. The youngster fullback from for Storm. Storm, he's going to play for Samoa. Who had a brilliant game a few weeks ago, didn't he, in, yeah. in Brisbane? That's right. And one of the all-time great rugby league names, Gordon Chan Kum Tong, who debuted for the Manly Sea Eagles right. uh, towards the end of the season. He's a young hooker, up yeah. and coming. I just think that's a. Oh, there's so much Samoan talent in rugby league, isn't there? At the moment, oh, they, they, yeah. they might just be a bit too inexperienced to to do well in the competition this year, though, I, w- I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. But just talking about, um, you know, representative... I, I mentioned the Matildas a few minutes ago. I just want to mention one thing that w- occurred in the um, NRL Women's Grand Final because the the Knights had a, a, a young woman called Sheridan Gallagher playing on the wing for them. And last year, she was the captain of the Matildas under-20s football side. Um, she she played in the under twenties football World Cup for them in um, South America um, in Costa Rica I think it was Middle America in fact it is not South America uh, she was the captain of that side and yet you know you might have thought that having done that she'd want to graduate to the full Matilda side and you know she was playing for Western Sydney Wanderers women's team in Sydney. But instead, she switched codes and joined the Newcastle Knights to play rugby league. Mm. And in Sunday's game, uh, it was fascinating because the Knights were 18-12 down to the Gold Coast Titans with just a little over 10 minutes to go. And she um, stole the ball in uh, a one-on-one tackle from from the Gold Coast's um, star player, Jamie Chapman, and set up the position for... Tamika Upton to score the game leveling try before she then scored the game winning try mm. and that's just a thing again something we ought to talk about more in rugby league you know we've got uh, we've got great athletes being attracted to play our game in in the women's game in Australia from other sports you mm. know and that, that's tremendous isn't it as far as I'm concerned there are quite a lot of obviously girls who have joined from rugby union from sevens rugby and mm. all sorts of things but you know it's a sign of how positively the game is doing over there mm. especially with opportunities to, to come over here and play you know in the premier league i know there's a lot of um yeah, women's players that come over and play over here mm. uh, like sam kerr for example um so yeah it's tremendous for our game that she's opting to stay and play in the nrl well, it's interesting that the gold coast titans were captained by georgia hale mm. who last year played for york knights of course you're well not york knights york valkyrie yeah um you know tr- tremendous really and if you know georgia roach um, played for the Knights and won a grand final winner's medal. Um, 
the the first women's man of or woman of steel mm-hmm. uh, in this country uh, three or four well four years ago it was now just great to see that sort of thing happening in my view mm, absolutely right um, now just one last uh, question before we quickly preview your picks for this weekend Super League games um, Penrith Panthers has been a lot of discussion about where they rank in in our old history are they one of the greatest teams to ever play in the NRL? Well, it's not it's not the, the, the question is not whether they're one of the greatest teams. The question is, are they the greatest team? Mm. You know, it, it, obviously they're one of the greatest teams. They've won it three years in a row now. Only yeah. two other teams have did, done that. One was St. George, from, who won it 11 years in a row, from 1956 to 66. They, they were fabulous. Um, but the other one was Parramatta, who won it three years in a row, from 84 to 86, I think it was, wasn't yeah. it? Mm. Um, you know, there's, there was quite a bit of discussion uh, from old Parramatta players um, when they were asked whether they would beat Penrith. And, of course, they say they would they would have done. And, you know, with modern training methods, who knows, they might. It's, mm. it's always a, a great debate. And it's a bit like boxers, you know, would, would Muhammad Ali have beaten Tyson Fury? You know, mm. you'll never know because, mm. obviously, you can't you can't put them against each other. Um, so yeah, but I, I I think they may well be the best team ever because the competition is is tougher than it's ever been. Back when Parramatta won their three games in a row, that was in the era before Brisbane Broncos, for example, came into the competition. Yeah. Before you had teams like Melbourne Storm, the New Zealand Warriors, all the Queensland sides. Um, I think you know. You've got to you've got to hand it to Penrith and say they are the best. And at the moment, they must be the favourites to make it four in a row next year. Yeah, you'd have to say so. Uh, the only other team that I think that could match it with them, apart from the Broncos, who almost matched it with them on the weekend, uh, would be yeah that Melbourne Storm side that had you know the likes of Cam Smith, Billy Slater, Cooper Cronk, and Greg oh, Inglis great. playing for them. I mean, them. they're all these are all great teams, but they're mm. all great teams within their own eras, aren't mm. they? And you know that that era comes and goes and one day they'll you know Nathan Clear, Cleary in a few years time will have retired and then we'll see whether the Panthers can keep it up mm. but um, there's no doubt I mean I think the you know the NRL has got some great possibilities now you know we've talked before on this podcast about uh, you know expanding the NRL into um, places where it it, it, you know, there are, there aren't NRL teams at the moment. There's, there's got to be scope for a second New Zealand team, mm. given how popular the Warriors have been this year. But, but also Perth and Adelaide, you know, and, and various other places. The, 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 the viewing figures for the NRL still don't, for the grand final, they still don't beat the AFL, Aussie Rules, because, of course, Aussie Rules is played in all the major cities in Australia. The NRL isn't played, you know, in, 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 there are five major cities in Australia, as you obviously know, and Aussie Rules is played in all five of them. The NRL Rugby League is played in just three of them. Mm-hmm. We've still not got a side in Perth, still not got a side in Adelaide. Mm-hmm. And until they do, Aussie Rules will always beat the, um, the NRL in viewing figures for those five major cities combined. Mm. There's no no doubt about that, mm. and they've got to they've got to one day uh, have the vision to have rugby league clubs back in those places. Mm. And they're slowly uh, creeping into Queensland territory. Obviously, we saw the Brisbane Lions competing in the yes. AFL Grand Final over the weekend as well, losing so. very narrowly. Yeah, yeah, and complaining about the refereeing as well. Didn't they? <laughs> yeah. You know, they um, they they yeah. did complain about that. Yeah, yeah. There yeah. was an advantage that was played in. At, the, um, in sort of in the dying minutes of the game, which probably shouldn't have been played advantage. I think uh, Brisbane would have preferred to have taken the free kick. And yeah, uh, yeah unfortunately, they came up very short, much like the Broncos. So yes, yes. A lot of upset. Drowning uh, each other's sorrows, I suppose. That's right. There'll yeah. be uh, sales in Kleenex tissue boxes will be going through the roof this yeah. week. In but Queensland. it's interesting that the Brisbane Lions supporters, I get the feeling, I obviously don't live in Brisbane. You, you have lived in Brisbane. You know far more than I do about it. But I just get the feeling that Brisbane is a city where there are lots and lots of incomers from the state of Victoria. And, of course, Brisbane Lions used to be the old Fitzroy Club in Melbourne, didn't they? And yep. uh, I, I suspect a lot of their fans will be fans who have come up from Victoria mm. and uh, who have brought their 
love of AFL with them. No, absolutely. Presumably. Yeah, and especially through COVID, there's a lot of uh, migration from south uh, up to Queensland. And mm. um, who could blame them? It's a beautiful place to live. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Sunny all year round. Yeah, well, I made a bad mistake when I didn't go there many years ago. But uh, yeah. <laughs> no, that's all right. There's always time can't to go be, back. Can't, you, can't be, you can't beat Yorkshire, though. Yeah, yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Um, now, this week's uh, matchups in the Super League, obviously, we've got um, the Catalans taking on the Saints 8 p.m. Friday. And Wigan taking on Hull KR 12.45 on Saturday. Who do you like in these two matchups? I like St. Helens and Wigan. Uh, I've got mm. to say, I think, I think all the signs are it's going to be a St. Helens and Wigan grand final. I can't see uh, the Catalans beating St. Helens on Friday night, although, you know, I'm there to be shot down on that one. Um, I, I, I just think, if, if you remember back in 2015... Lee's Rhinos won the grand final with Kevin Sinfield and it was his last ever game and he ended his career by lifting the grand final trophy. Um, to me, you know, I can see, you know, James Roby is the most iconic player since Kevin Sinfield mm -hmm. and it would be such a wonderful end to his career to be able to lift that grand final trophy again. And he, he's such a great captain, I think that I, I can easily imagine that happening. And, um, you know, there is, is obviously the Catalans are in the way um, and probably Wigan will be in the grand final at, uh, at Old Trafford. But <clears throat> I think it would be such a special day at Old Trafford if, um, if, it, if it were a St. Helens versus Wigan game, um, you know, for that, uh, for that reason, really. So, but, you know, the Catalans <coughs> have, have, you know, they've they've got the points on the board this year and it um, you know and we talk about retiring iconic players the third most iconic player since sinfield retired is is, is um sam Tompkins, of mm. course who's going to be bowing out uh this season as well so this friday will be the very final game for either Fra uh, sam Tompkins or for um, James Roby and Lou McCarthy Scarsbrook. So, you know, and if Sam Tompkins were at uh, Old Trafford on, on October the 14th, that would be equally, you know, an equally great event. So uh, it's, you know, but I, I, I still think Saints and Wigan uh, w will be will be the two clubs there. Mm. And you've been sort of predicting that for a while now. And oh, yeah, though, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sure you'll appreciate it if you can... Well, predict that. <laughs> anybody who goes on what I predict will be very foolish, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that's all right. Yeah, it's um, yeah, shaping up to be a really good weekend of football, that's for sure. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to get into? Anything else you'd like to mention before we wrap things up here today, Martin? Well, the only thing, the only final thing, probably there's been a lot of debate about what the future of League One will be in the Championship, given that London scholars have dropped out. There will only be nine teams in League One next year. Mm -hmm. um, some people are saying that... Um, There'll be 23 teams combined and they all ought to combine in, into one league next year, do away with the two separate competitions. I think that would be a really bad thing to do because um, you, you can't change or you shouldn't change the, um, the, the rules once the season's been finished. As far as I'm concerned, Dewsbury and Doncaster have been promoted and Keithley and Newcastle have been relegated from the championship. Give them a chance to... <clears throat> you know, re recover in the lower league or, you know, compete at the higher league level. And, you know, nine teams is not ideal. There's no doubt about that. But if you had each team playing every other team three times, that would give you 24 fixtures in 27 rounds. So each team in League One would have three bye weekends hmm. in, in a 27-week in a season. And 27 weeks is the same number of weeks as the season for... Super League and Championship. So I think that would work quite well. And it would give Newcastle and Keithley a chance to, you know, recover their, um, you know, get their mojo back, so to speak, and um, and challenge for promotion again. But what they need is probably, the, it wouldn't be a bad thing to have at least one more new club in, in, in League One if we can find that somewhere. There's long been talk of Bristol, for example, coming into Super League, and it would be great to see a, a new club a bit nearer to Cornwall in the far southwest. And in fact, the one reason why they might not go for a nine-team league next year is that none of the other teams wants to have to visit Cornwall twice in one season. You know, that's the big, that's the big, um, 
you know, that's a big no-no as far as those teams are concerned. And, you know, it is a very long journey and most clubs don't want to have to do it more than once. But bear in mind that Cornwall have to do it every other week. Mm. So, you know, it's quite a challenge on, on all sides. But I think it's I think it's great to see Cornwall playing rugby league. And, um, you know, you're still going to be here next summer, Jake. I think we ought to send you down to Cornwall one day. Yeah. Uh, you know, for a holiday sometime next year yeah. to go and see the Cornwall team playing. Yeah, that'd be I great. Think you'd, I think you'd love it. Is it uh, quite a passionate fan base? Well, it's it's about a thousand people, I think. I mean, they stopped publishing their crowds, you know, like a lot of clubs have done. Mm. But, you know, it's played in the very small town of Penryn, which is quite near Penzance. It's right on the edge of Cornwall, actually. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's been very well received down there. And, uh, you know, it'd be, it'd be my, you know, I really do hope that they you know, carry on and grow stronger and, uh, you know, take take our game to, you know, really consolidate <laughs> the game down there and, um, you know, make it make it ultimately a stronghold of the game. Mm, yeah, absolutely. No, it's exciting times uh, and I'm dreading the, the last weekend of rugby league football we have. You know, it's going to be a long off-season waiting for next year to kick off. We'll still find something to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's right. Yeah, Always off-season years, that's for sure. Uh, now, before we uh, sign off today... Um, just remember, if you do want to get yourself a League Express subscription, we'll be publishing all throughout the off-season bar, maybe one or two weeks over that Christmas, New Year period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, head along to www.totalrl.com forward slash shop. Grab yourself a Rugby League World magazine subscription while there as well and maybe a copy of uh, Richard Della Riviere's book, um, 50 Wigan Legends in Their Own Words. Well worth well worth buying and reading. It's a great book. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if you're still with us, um, watching on YouTube or listening on Spotify, Google or Apple, don't forget you can subscribe on YouTube if you do want to sit there and watch Martin and I discuss the news every week. Um, or yeah, just listen to us through Spotify, Google or Apple Podcast. Um, but yeah, we'll wrap it up here and do it all again next week, Martin. Thanks a lot, Jake. Good to see you again and uh, we look forward to uh, another great weekend of Rugby League. Yeah, absolutely right. All right, cheers. Thank you.